Awesome. We are good to go. Well, welcome back, John. It's very nice to see you again. It's very good. It's very good to be back. Uh, I thought our last conversation was just great. So I'm very pleased to be here. Yeah. And I think we've built a, I was just saying, I think we've built a good foundation to kind of take some next steps on. So honestly, just right off the bat, I think the easiest place to start this is if you have not seen the first conversation that we had together, uh, that is required reading for this because we're going to kind of just take it with a running start, but I might do a, a two minute summary for people just Please. to give a sense of kind of where we're at, because I think we came to a really nice end point with our last conversation. So the, the kind of arc we took was by nature of being human, you know, a, a thinking thing in a body, you are always confronted with perennial problems. Mm -hmm. These are always there, always lurking. Um, they adapt to you as you adapt to them and left unattended, uh, either one or many, these can actually be a highly detrimental force to an individual, a community, a culture at large. They can actually be on the level of an existential threat for the long-term viability of these things. And, you know, as they get left unattended, as the kind of weeds grow, you end up with something like a meaning crisis, right? Something where there's just rampant confusion, isolation, all these things that, that stem from this. And so, okay, you know, humans are highly adaptable machines. You know, we're not going to stand there and just take the punches. And so to address these things, we actually do have some responses. We have psychotechnologies, ecologies of practices, you know, spiritual and religious activities, communities that, you know, much like the perennial problems can be adaptive, grow with us, scale in size and number so that we can actually do this kind of dance with chaos. Right. And actually, you know, stay functional, stay healthy and stay smart. And another thing that's, I think, important with them is all of those things are non-physical in nature, right? They're not an actual tool that you hold. They're a mental tool because all of the problems that we have are non-physical in nature, or at least the perennial problems that we were highlighting. They're just, yeah. you know, things that come on a, on a spiritual level, on a communal level. And so then you know, we, we basically spoke about, well, when a group of people come together to cultivate those things and put them into practice, it looks very much like a religion. Yes. yes. And uh, so, cool. So that's basically what we need right now, because we also, you know, gave light to the fact that we're probably in the middle of one of these right now. There are a number of things coming up that are becoming increasingly untenable uh, if left alone. And so, you know, some work needs to be done. And why does it need to be done? Because the culture as it stands right now, arguably is generating a lot of these things. And if it continues on this path, that's probably not a way we want to go. So we actually want this thing and want to create this thing to kind of bottom up, usurp and steal the culture back in a way that actually prioritizes the individuals, their flourishing and the you know collective well-being of the whole. Well said, very well said. And we kind of topped it off with a little cherry of, well, how do we do that? We have some avenues. We have Dialogos, flow states, circling communities at large, the serious play, actually architecting the culture that we want to live in. And so then that leads us here today. You know, the, the way I was just bringing it up to you is a lot of that, a lot of that first conversation was making the case for the what and the why, right? What is actually going on here? And A, why should we care? And again, I think if you care about yourself, others in the world, you should actually have some skin in the game here because it's, it's on that level of importance. But what I notice both in myself and in others in this space is, you know, there can be this showing up where you have this motivation, you're, you're hungry, you're like, yes, I want to do this, like, let's go do this, you know, I'm in, tell me what to do. And that, that almost becomes the problem is we show up here and there's this kind of gaping void of, well, I don't know what to do. You know, I, I don't know what tools I have. I don't know where the other people are. And there's this kind of yawning opening that, that spawns up. So I hope that, and again, this is a little more uncharted territory here, but I hope that we can like fumble our way into, yeah, here are some of the tools you have. Here are some of the ways you can think about doing this. Here's some of the scaffolding you have. And if you can start filling that in, you know, you might, and through some iterations, we might actually, you know, have something that looks like a cohesive, coherent answer to this. 
Great. That sounds fantastic. So one of the things that I think will be important that we kind of just brushed over last time. So we did the whole ecologies of practices, psychotechnologies, what they are, how they can be used, why they're important. But you and Jordan Hall have also been covering some really interesting ground on the meta psychotechnology. Yeah. And I'd love if you could just delineate that a little more, explore that, because I think that will be a, you know, we were kind of talking about this starting point. Where do I start from? What do I have? That feels in that, in that realm. Okay. Thanks, Eric. Uh, by the way, just great summary. Great, uh, great setup. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been doing some discussions with Jordan Hall and then uh, four-way discussions with Jordan Hall, Guy Senstock, Christopher Master Pietro, also some three-way discussions with Andrew Sweeney and with Chris, with Andrew Sweeney and Zach Stein. So, you know, doing a lot of this, uh, working it out uh, and, and also exemplifying it um, for people. And, and the, uh, my main partner in this work is Chris, Christopher Master Pietro. Uh, we're putting together right now an anthology of, of, of the, the major players in this movement. Ooh, awesome. Uh, it's called Inner and Outer Dialogues. Uh, the, the, the anthology is going to be done soon. It will introduce you to all of this, uh, the dialogos and dialectic, and then a whole family of practices like dialectic uh, for trying to put you into uh, dialogos. Um, you know, Guy is going to be there. Chris and I have written stuff. Uh, Thomas and Elizabeth uh, from Evolve, uh, Taylor Barrett, who's doing stuff on uh, bringing an experimental model in, uh, Nora Bateson and a warm data lab, like, uh, wow. there's a ton of people. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's going to be, there's a resource that's being generated right now and it's going to be uh, done soon that will basically do two things. It will introduce you to this whole area and this topic introduce you to the main players, their main ideas, uh, so you can uh, pursue um, them individually and also see how they could be put together. So I'm going to try and speak to sort of at that level. Uh, yep. I, I'll, I'll, of course, I have to I'll, I have to give emphasis to my own particular thing because that's what I know more intimately. But I, I do want it understood that when I talk about dialectic and how it affords dialogos, I, I'm not making an exclusive claim here. In fact, I see it as belonging to a family that's exemplified in this anthology. Now, an another thing about, there's one sense in which I think you're absolutely right, and it's appropriate to start here, but so the order of intelligibility and the order of explanation is not the pedagogical order, right? Um, the, the or in the sense of the order of training. So you don't start with dialectic as, uh, as your training. That's not... That's not how I see it. There's a pedagogical program you would engage in in order to undertake it. So that we, can, we can come back to that, but I want it understood that, yes, I think this is a good place to start the discussion. I don't want it understood that this is the place where you would start to answer the question you asked me. Yeah, how do I get started? So. Okay, so let's be clear that we're, this is a good place to start the discussion, yeah. uh, but this is not the, 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 you know, the, the best answer, the initial answer to how do I get started? So the idea, and I do, and you're right, I do owe the emergence of I, this idea uh, appropriately enough to a dialogue I was having with Jordan Hall. Um, Jordan and I have, have become good friends. And uh, Jordan was talking about the need for a meta-psychotechnology. And the idea here is what a meta-psychotechnology is, it's a, techno it's a, a higher order technology that, whose main function is to help you collect and curate practices and coordinate them. And we talked a bit about, you know, how to coordinate the practices within an ecology of practices. And the idea is it's going to help you collect, curate, coordinate, vet uh, particular practices uh, so that you get a viable ecology of practice, viable in two directions, mm -hmm. viable for you individually and viable so that you can share it with other people. It doesn't mean that everybody will have the same ecology of practices. There's, there's going to be Right, uh, very much. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a pluralistic model, not a relativistic model, a pluralistic model in which people are going to have shared principles, shared sort of vocabulary and grammar for how they put the ecologies together, and then they'll have different. I'll share this set with you, and this set with her, and you two. Right, it's like the way families 
right? If you look at a bunch of people, they don't all look the same. They, they sh share overlapping features and they all belong together. So that's the, that's the model I want for people to understand this. So the idea here is why would it be a meta psychotechnology? Well, it's a meta psychotechnology because it's going to be the place where we can most directly cultivate in a mutually sustaining and mutually affording fashion, both individual wisdom and collective wisdom. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna try and coordinate how we bootstrap individual intelligence into individual wisdom. And that's gonna be coordinated with how we bootstrap collective intelligence, the collective intelligence within distributed cognition up into collective wisdom. And the idea is that's kind of the best we have. That's the best place we can turn to in order to get guidance, in order to get wealth, wisdom in how we can choose and you know, collect, curate, coordinate various practices into an ecology practice. So the idea is um, that uh, dialectic is the practice and then dialogos is the process it ensues. So the idea is that uh, dialectic, insofar as it re regularly and reliably affords uh, getting into dialogos, is gonna give you things that will help to counteract all the negative effects of the autodidactic religion of me that people fall into. Uh, so it, which tends to exacerbate self-deceptive, self-destructive uh, patterns. It, it can enhance narcissism, which is very dangerous. It, it contributes to a sense of fragmentation and isolation. Uh, I understand why people do it for reasons we talked about at length last time, but the idea is it will help uh, counteract that. It will also be a place in which people can practice and also deeply experience those enhanced connections, the enhanced religio, we talked about last time, you know, the enhanced sense of connectedness to themselves, to each other and the world. What's amazing when people get into these practices is they discover a kind of intimacy that is, uh, it, it's not, of course, it's not sexual intim intimacy or anything like that, but it's, it, it's kind of, it's, the adjective is, uh, uh, the, the adjective that should be used has the wrong meaning. Because what happens is people become more intimate with um, the, with intelligibility, with how they're making sense and how the world can make sense to them and how, the, how they can make sense to each other. And all of those three intelligibilities um, are, are intermixing. So the adjective I would, should use for syntactic reasons to talk about the intimacy is intellectual intimacy, but that just sounds totally wrong. Um, and so that's why I don't use it. So it's something more like you know, what, what was captured in the Greek term philia, uh, that sense of reciprocal intimacy of making sense with each other together. And it's a, so what we're trying to do is literally enact philia of Sophia, of wisdom. And so the point is that dialectic has both um, a group um, aspect to it and an individual practice aspect. So it also helps you to bridge between community and individual practice, and that's good because we want to always keep the tension, the creative tension between individuation and participation going. And so it helps people to bridge. It helps them to see how they can fit in to a larger community and then also how that larger can, community can fit into them. So it helps to bridge uh, that way. And so it also helps to build those communities. Um, and those communities are going to be important um, for people to make most of the transformations they're actually seeking um, because uh, most of the way we grow is through other people, both in the sense of going through them and by means of them. Um, and so the, those are the reasons why dialectic, it's a, it's a, it's a psychotechnology, but it's a meta psychotechnology because the process it engenders, Dialogos, is so central to uh, addressing all of these concerns about how we would create an ecology of practices and situate it within a Sangha, within a supportive community in which people are meeting together to regularly um, edify, challenge, and promote each other's growth. Yeah, beautiful. And again, this, this theme, this came up a lot in the first conversation as well. And for very good reason, this sense of the dynamic 
reorganizing feedback yeah. loop. And I think that is one of, I've, I've heard in one of these conversations, you know, I think that is one of these central, not central, but um, major obstacles with the classic established religions today is that there is almost an entire lack of that, that yeah. feedback loop. It is very much just one way. And in that sense, you know, there is no, there is no steering. There's no turning or realigning. And yeah, I think that was a beautiful explanation. And one of the other reasons that came up for me was just there's a there's a growing sense of time is of the essence here. You know, we oh, should have yeah. we should have been doing this a long time ago and we're still just trying to agree on the rules and stuff. And so if we're going to do anything, we should have some reasonable expectation that it's going to at least be our best shot at this moment. Yeah. Right. And if we don't have a way of actually discerning that and then taking action on it, well, that's almost a non-starter from the beginning. This isn't exactly just a spray and pray uh, formula that we want to use. We want to have some semblance of, okay, vetting and enacting and again, getting that quick feedback. And so, yeah, that does seem like a, yeah, it, I think that, you know it. I think, uh, I mean, that's one of Jordan Hall's, uh, I think, excellent points. He keeps pointing out, I, like myself, Jordan is very respectful of the traditional religions. Um, but also like myself, he thinks the urgency of the, the issues that we're facing um, and how those issues are themselves dynamically complexifying issues. They're, right, they're, they're, they, they are evolving and they're evolving to become ever more complex at an ever increasing rate. And so uh, the way, again, again, with much respect, even reverence for, uh, you know, uh, uh, the established or traditional uh, wisdom traditions and religions, right? We have to also, I agree with him, we need something different now. Yeah. We need something that's a difference in kind because the difference in the degree of change is so great that we need a difference in kind. So we need to try and think about how to put this together in a way that has a corresponding capacity for dynamic evolution so that we can constantly, as you said, dance with the emerging chaos uh, in an effective and adaptive manner. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so one of the, one of the groups I want to bring up into this because I feel like they dance around the outskirts of this and at least in, in my vantage point are growing both as a as a positive side and as a and as a negative side, which is the growing spiritual but not religious group. Yeah. Um, I have my own thoughts on on kind of this group and and how how it plays into all of this. But do you have any do you have any initial thoughts in hearing that? Like where? Yeah, yeah. So I think I mean there's a sense in which the spiritual but not religious are the people that I'm most trying to reach uh, yeah. because. With, with this idea of the religion that's not a religion. Because I understand, well, I'm sorry, I don't mean to sound pretentious. I think I have a fairly good understanding uh, of where they're at and where they're coming from. So on the one hand, um, to say they're not religious, what do they mean by saying they're not religious? Let's, let's work it that way. Yep. Well, what they typically mean is they don't want to belong to any organization that has any kind of political structure, any kind of stable um, ideological framework that has to be adhered to. Um, now, now, there's mistakes in that, but let's, let's try and pick up on what's motivating it. Well, my, what's motivating it is they have, right, they have seen um, those, they have seen political organizations and ideological uh, worldviews drench the world in blood and continue to do so. And they have an intuition often, sometimes it's more of an explicit argument, that that way of approaching things is driving the polarization that is ripping the, you know, well, ripping the United States apart. And in, in some ways that's of course infecting the rest of the world. It's inevitably going to. Um, so I understand where that's coming from. Why don't they just become atheists then? Why don't they just line up behind Sam Harris uh, or Richard Dawkins. Uh, it, 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 funny enough, Sam Harris is actually becoming, uh, is this the right way to say it? He's becoming more and more spiritual with time um, as things unfold. Uh, but you know what I mean? Why not just become a, an atheist and just go, well, because first of all, the secular political 
ideological uh, organizations and movements have been, been just as bad. And in fact, if not worse, in drenching the world in blood. So no, right? And then the idea that, and this is, you know, this goes to the heart of what we talked about last time. There was something in these religions. There was something in these religions. There were practices. There's an intuitive sense that, you know, I, I get into these patterns, these self-deceptive, self-destructive patterns, and I get disconnected from myself and other people in the world. And I, I don't know how to come, how to integrate uh, aspects of myself in, in a way that seems to take or to sustain. Uh, and so I, I, I want to be spiritual, meaning typically I want to cultivate practices of self-transcendence, self-transformation and that will make me wiser. I mean, that's not always the word that's used, but I would argue that's, that's always, that's always yeah. the concept that's being used. And so they, they, they get that, you know, wisdom is needed and that wisdom isn't just like learning knowledge from a book. Wisdom, it's the kind of knowing that requires deep transformation. And so what they mean is, well, I care about these problems of meaning and I care about cultivating wisdom, but I'm terrified of both the religious past and the political past, and I'm terrified of ideological thinking. And so I'm gonna be spiritual, but not religious. Do you think that's a fair representation of what's at work for this group? Yeah, yeah. So, so the thing about that for me is, I, I understand that problem and that's why I try to articulate what I call the religion that's not a religion in that it, it's a religion in that it's trying to acknowledge that there's so much from a religious heritage that we need uh, to we need to exact. But it's also acknowledging that we don't want to fall into uh, the, 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 the traditional thinking patterns, even the secular versions of them well, within you know Nazism and communism, uh, because those are, to my mind, pseudo-religious ideologies, uh, uh, and, and so we don't want we we want to somehow do that acceptation without falling into any of the any of the totalitarian temptations, um, and populism is also a totalitarian temptation, and it's also a highly pseudo-religious uh, phenomenon. And if you don't think so, um, look at how people are following Trump. I mean, it, yeah. it's right. Uh, so. Um, so all of that being the case, uh, I, I think I take, I take that problem very seriously. Now, I think the spiritually but not religious people are also making some very serious mistakes. Uh, so one of the most serious mistakes is that tends to be identified with, well, this is a purely individual project. Um, this is something I do on my own, I do it for myself, and that very quickly is it really not a religion? It's just the religion of me, yeah. the religion of me and why my experiences are sacred and the things I go through. And then the problem with that is it has the problems we talked about earlier that really, really exacerbates all of the dangers of autodidactism. It yeah. locks you into um, individualism as an ideology. And let's be clear here. I'm not talking about moral individual responsibility. That's something we all bear and is inescapable, and we are obligated for that. I'm talking about a particular ideology of how human beings are and how they should live that is called individualism, that was generated historically in the Enlightenment period. And I think that ideology is largely bullshit because most of our development and most of our cognition is done in distributed cognition. And there's increasing evidence that we are much better at growing and overcoming self-deception in distributed cognition. We are much more rational in distributed cognition than we are in individual cognition. Now, of course, distributed cognition can go off the rails too, and that's why we have to do what we were talking about earlier. We have to, we have to organize it properly. But I think the idea that, well, I can do this individually, autodidactically, that's, you know, you're gonna, that, that, that's gonna be rife with error. Secondly, it tends to promote a kind of narcissism. It tends to, uh, it tends, and the individual is, individualism and narcissism, they tend to reinforce each other. You can, because what tends to happen is people tend to get into the idea that what I should be doing is collecting wonderful experiences 
that I can put on my little ego trophy shelf that show to myself and to anybody who challenges me how really unique and special I am and therefore why you should pay attention to me or consider me important even though I haven't done anything particularly ethically or epistemically useful or important to other people. And, 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 and that's a big, big problem. The third thing, and these are not necessarily separate, these are only analytic distinctions, they're mm -hmm. often found together, right, is the phenomena of spiritual bypass, which is yeah. the idea that I will avoid, you know, pain and trauma and deep character flaws and personality disorders or defects because, but by being spiritual. And I'll just, uh, I'll bypass all of the messy shit that is at the core of human spirituality. And you don't think it is. Re look through the wisdom traditions. They yeah. keep telling people, you don't, right? You, 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 that, that, that messy stuff, that yucky stuff, right? That is an integral part of spirituality. And so people use spiritual but not religious as a way of engaging in spiritual bypass. And so there's just a lot of dangers. Again, remember what I said at the beginning, everyone. I understand. I, I, I think I have a, a fairly good explanation of why people do this. What's the, what's the reasoning and what's the motivation? But I'm asking everyone now to understand equally the dangers and the threats and that we, we need to pursue an alternative to spiritual, but not religious. Yeah. Yeah, that was incredible. So many of the things, I have actually a few points to add on that because that was absolutely masterful. You know, and again, there is, I think it is worth acknowledging, like it, it is coming from a place of good faith, right? Yes. It's, it's people's like, I do recognize the need in this because I probably, yeah. you know, they probably come from a point where I didn't have this before. All these things came up as expected, right? Again, wisdom tradition has been talking about this for a while. And so it's like, okay, I'm going to do this. And then we run into this like baby in the bathwater thing where it's like, well, I don't want to believe in the, you know, resurrection of Jesus and these fairy tales. So obviously the whole thing is bunk. Let me go discover all this for myself. I think the biggest point of it that comes up for me is, you know, we were just talking about the time is of the essence here. And it's yeah. like, I'm sorry, I don't have the time to wait for you to make all the mistakes that people have been making for several thousand years. Yeah. And they wrote it down. They wrote yeah. down the ways to actually like avoid that or get through it easier. And yet you're just off, you know, running around doing all this stuff for yourself. You know, you come across the, oh, I realized I'm God. It's like, okay, you know, we got to go through this thing. That's going to take up some more time. <laughs> right, right. There's, there's just all these things that have been written down. And oh, I think- yeah. And again, one of the ways that gets avoided is if you are taking this seriously, because it can be, I think there is this sense of, you know, the spiritual world as kind of hippy dippy nonsense, like it's all just flower stuff, but digging down or taking it seriously enough, it is, it can be extremely difficult. You're, you're yes. you know, yep. you're rewriting the way you view reality. You're rewriting your place in, in the entire story. It is not always easy. And to counterbalance that, you need containers. You need containers that are conducive to do the already difficult work. And if you're doing that by yourself and you don't have the community, the container, again, it just goes haywire. It goes haywire really quickly and you can actually do an extreme amount of damage to yourself. This is how you get stuff like cults too. Like this yeah, is how you yeah, get very much, ridiculous very much. stuff. And yep. it's like, yeah. So to your point, like there are real threats and dangers and the greatest part about that is we don't actually have to figure out how to answer those because they've been answered by several different traditions for several thousand years it's like yeah okay like the thing they are right here and yes again nothing is perfect no one is perfect nothing we've ever made is perfect but that does not mean by any sense that we can just toss out the entire uh utility of it i think that's well said the difficult task um is again to, as you said, respect the good faith, is that how do I, and this is where, again, where you're doing this on your own is not going to be not a good idea. You know, you should, so when you, you on one, like think about holding in two hands. On one hand, you should be looking at these traditions, but you're, you're trying to, you have this question. Well, how do I know what I should take from these? And also, how should I take it from them? Yeah. And this is where, 
cognitive science can be a tremendous help. And science is also something you don't do autodidactically. It's something that you do by getting involved, right? Yeah. Like, and you may not want or want or be able to belong to that community, but there are many people, uh, you know, I, I, I'm one of them, who, who are offering to help bridge, who are offering to help say, here is that cognitive science, and here is how you can make use of it. So you can get guidance on how to draw from these traditions and how you can draw from these traditions in a way that will ultimately fit into a scientific worldview, yeah. potentially transform it. And, 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 and that, that's a tricky thing. And it, 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 it's also interacting with this other creative tonos, this tension we're trying to manage between, as you said, providing people with containers, you got to frame, or you're going to hit the, you're going to hit the, you're going to hit the frame problem if you don't frame things. Um, so totally, totally on board with that. But you also want to give space, right? You know, so that emergence can happen precisely because we can't just repeat the past. That, this is where Jordan's argument comes in again. Uh, and we, we have to acknowledge that there are emerging communities of practice that are doing what we're talking about, but they're also innovating and coming up with new ideas. Like I was just talking again to him yesterday, my good friend, uh, Rafe Kelly, and the kind of things he's doing. Uh, and so like trying to get all of that held properly together, this is again why we need, we need distributed cognition. We need dialogos. We've got to, we've got, we've got to get, we got to give it our very, we got to tap into our evolving very best of distributed cognition in order to help people with these problems. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. The one thing that came up there as well is um, what, when people do try to, to take stuff, cause they might actually get to the point of also acknowledging, well, it's like, okay, well, the whole thing isn't, isn't nonsense, but then you end up with this, I called it, oh, I was writing about this the other day. I called it the Mr. God Tato head where you just end up with this <laughs> mashup of like yeah. Christian, Neo-Buddhist, Hindu stuff. And it just comes together in this amorphous yeah. blob that actually ends up making less sense when they try to articulate it than any yeah. of the individual yeah. ones. Yeah. And it drives this sense of, well, this is the process of a lifetime. And, you know, in some ways that point is valid, but in others it's, well, what are you actually trying to do here? And again, even, you know, that question becomes impossible to answer because they don't know what they're exactly trying to do. They don't have language for it. They don't know how long it should take. They don't have pathways to actually go do this. And it's like, yes, you know, your evolving relationship with life is an ongoing process. But if you're just trying to, you know, come into right relationship with yourself, that doesn't have to be something that takes eight decades. That yeah. could actually be, you know, an outcome of a process. However, you're not in a community. You don't have the scaffolding to actually do that. And so, yeah, there's this growing just no man's land of I'm doing this, but I don't know what I'm doing, why I'm doing it or where oh. I'm going. And it's like, again, you know, guys, we need to we need to get this together like yesterday. We need to all be able to sit at the table and again, to your point, actually be a contributing player to the game and not yep. just kind of fumbling around the game board. I actually need to go from players to designers. We're designing a new one. And if this thing is going to take you a lifetime, well, you're never going to be able to take your seat at the table with the rest of us. That's, that's well said. That's very well said. Yeah. We, we, by Leah Sophia, right? <laughs> we, need, we need the best wisdom we can come up with the chances that you're going to get that on your own. Uh, by being an eclectic uh, dabbler are, are very small, are very small. Um, again, I understand why people are tempted that way. Um, and I, I want to be responsive to that. But um, I agree with you. I, that, that, is not, that is not a good strategy. And it's certainly, especially now, uh, not a good strategy because of the exigent nature of the situation we're in. Yeah. I have one one line I want to introduce here from one of your other conversations. I don't even know if it's going to require a comment. It may very well not, but I just loved the way it was said. You spoke a couple of weeks ago with uh, Jun Sung Kim. Yes. I say yeah. that reasonably. Yeah. Jun Sung. Jun Sung yeah. Kim. He's a, he is a former student. Um, he is an ongoing RA and TA and co-author with me. That and 
big hat tip to that conversation, the cognitive okay. science of magic. That was unbelievable. One of the lines that came up is, uh, you know, religion and spirituality as practices do not require the supernatural as a theory to function. That's right. And I don't even know if you have a comment on that, but I think that's absolutely worth putting in because it may very well be, again, there aren't many current examples of religious spiritual institutions that don't invoke some sense of supernatural woo, which I think turns a lot of people away from them. It does. It's not a requirement. No, it's not. I mean, and, you know, and the work that uh, I'm doing and the work that Jun Sung's doing, the work we're doing together is gathering increasing empirical evidence to support that claim, by the way. Beautiful. Okay? So there's good theoretical argument and good empirical evidence. Um, part of the problem, um, I think, is, uh, I mean, the Abrahamic religions were really successful in uh, sort of getting us to deeply in believe almost like into the grammar of how we think about this, uh, that, um, that their model of religion um, w- was how all religions work. And I mean, this caused so much disaster. It was one of many reasons why Euro- European colonialism was so devastating uh, because the Europeans would go into these other cultures um, and they couldn't even find a phenomena that was separable out that they could call religion. So they would have to sort of, you know, you know force that with sort of the opposite of pigeonholing, extracting something out that really shouldn't be extracted out, and then re-understanding it in terms of a belief system and all this stuff. And, you know, that was one of the reasons why, uh, and then often just treating it like noise and garbage, right? Uh, And so I think we should, we've got good historical reasons why we should pause and think about that. But we know that the supernatural is something that, and I talk about this in my series, I give the uh, argument, it's something that emerged historically within the West. Um, and so thinking that, well, that's the way it just has to be, or it's not a religion. It's like, okay, fine. If you don't want to call it religion, if it doesn't have the supernatural, then I'm interested in religion or something else, yeah. right? I'm interested <laughs> in whatever it is that's enhancing religio so that people have experiences that they call are sacred because they get into right relationship with what is most ultimately re- real about themselves, each other, and the world. And if you don't want to call that religion, then fine, I don't care. But I think that is the core of what religions have done, and I've given arguments for that. And we have very clear historical precedents. The Neoplatonic tradition, right? Yes, it has, right, it has metaphysical levels, but they're not like um, our notion of the supernatural. In fact, you can see the some of the church fathers taking the Neoplatonic tradition and wrestling it so it fits in, right? And, and, and eventually gets organized into, especially people like Aquinas, right? Gets organized into our category of the supernatural. And there, so first of all, that's a problematic category. Second, as I've argued, I think it's a way in which we're, we, we sort of legitimated and ossified the two, I don't know where if that noise is coming from yours or my end, um, uh, legitimated and ossified um, the two worlds mythology. The idea that reality is made up of two fundamentally uh, different worlds. Um, and I, and I, again, I think that was something I understand and I, I try to explain why that mythology arose, but the scientific worldview will not countenance that. Um, and, and, and if you say, well, I'm just gonna ignore the scientific worldview, good luck, go try that. Try that right now during COVID, right? What does that mean? I, like, I, I, I don't, uh, like, well, I don't believe this. Well, yeah, yeah, you do, because you go to the doctor and you turn on the internet and you use all of this technology and electricity and electromagnetism and physics and chemistry. And by, like, you can't, that's just pretense, okay? Now, I'm not, I'm, I, I'm not arguing for scientism. I'm not saying that no. science is the only thing or that all of the current claims of science are true. I think that's ridiculous. But the idea that we can somehow, well, I'm just gonna ignore the scientific worldview and I'm just gonna somehow keep the supernatural, the two worlds mythology, that strikes me as very uh, non-viable. It's like I said, we have good historical and cross-cultural reason to suspect that category, to suspect that that is of the essence of religion. We have geniuses like Plotinus and Spinoza who gave us uh, alternatives profound monisms, ultimately, 
that do not support uh, the, the dualism of a supernaturalism. That dualism tended to support an internalized version of the two worlds. We internalize that dualism as a deep dualism between mind and body. The mind and body are two separate and two distinct kind of things. And we, were, and we sort of reduced religion into like very much in the head uh, and our sense of who and what we are and what we're now discovering both in cognitive science and the whole rise of the embodied movement, movement, they, sh they should come up with a better name, um, is that no, that, that dualism of mind and body, it's just not sustainable. And so we've got to get rid of that commitment. And so I think trying to come up with a way of being spiritual, and you now know that I don't mean in an autodidactic, individualistic, isolated, monological fashion, trying to be spiritual um, without recourse to the supernatural is deeply needed today. It's deeply, deeply needed. And it is, a, I've already given you arguments for why it's possible. It's definitely possible. Um, and it's already happening. It's already happening. So if we can come to a place where we don't have to invoke, I, we don't have to invoke or commit to these powerful kinds of dualisms. These dualisms were originally functional, but the problem is they became malfunctional. And a dualism that becomes malfunctional becomes a profound dichotomous yeah. disconnection. And it's, it, it disconnects you in profound ways from yourself, from each other in the world. And that undermines the religio, the meaning making, the sacredness in a profound way. Yeah, and actually that visual that you just gave there is, a, I think, a feeling that a lot of people have coming into the space. It's like, I am torn between these drives or these yeah, feelings yeah. inside of me, and I just, it's untenable. I feel like I'm coming apart at the end. It's like, yeah, it's, uh, it's very true. It's always, it always makes me laugh, um, you know, particularly for your whole Meaning Crisis series. Like, yeah, these ideas were actually invented. Like mind body dualism wasn't just a, a thing that existed. It was actually created. And it's like, wow, these things have become extremely, extremely ingrained. Yeah, Greg Enriquez and I are doing a new series right now that's on my YouTube channel called Untangling mm -hmm. the World Not of Consciousness, in which we're going through that history and we're trying to come up with a non dualistic account of the nature and function of consciousness. As again, trying to ultimately address uh, the meaning crisis. Beautiful. There's a big, uh, there's a big setup folks take note. So, and you know, we, we spoke about this after we stopped recording in the first one, but I do want to weave in another, another thinker and some theories into this that I, I've found at least personally very useful that of Jamie wheel and some of his, some of his yeah. work around ethical culture. We talked in the first one about how, you know, this kind of religion that's not a religion and stealing the culture and the importance yeah. of culture are, are more of like an interweaving DNA than, than separate initiatives here. But a lot of this conversation, a lot of our first one was around, well, we need to get in relationship to self, other, and world. Mm -hmm. And again, we bookmarked this whole beginning as a kind of, well, what, you know, what, what do I do? I understand that I need to do that. How do I actually do that? And he, Jamie puts forward, and again, I think this was in with some collaboration from you as well, these three pillars of if you're going to have practices, they should probably address these three things. And I love them. Ecstasis, like a feeling of self-transcendence, connecting to something greater than yourself. Catharsis, the kind of deep healing that comes from that sense of that we can get of being an isolated individual. And community, communitas, right? The yeah. sense that we are actually in this together, all going through the need for those first two. Anything coming up for you around that? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I have talked with, I uh, give all credit to Jamie in, uh, in uh, uh, organizing those. I've talked to him, I think, had an extended conversation with, with him just once. And then there's been some email exchanges. Um, I, I think that's important. Um, um, independent of him, I was talking about ecstasis. I have ecstasis tattooed on my leg. Uh, I was talking about ecstasis and communitas uh, for a very long time. Um, now, so the, the part that uh, Jamie has put more emphasis on 
uh, that I haven't addressed as much, but um, I am turning my attention to is catharsis. Uh, again, with that, and, and Jamie doesn't mean it this way. He, he, don't think of it just in the Freudian sense of sort of, uh, <gasps> right, you know, yeah. the, the big discharge, right, uh, and Freudian pun intended. Um, uh, so it, it's not that. Um, uh, it's, it's more of an Aristotelian sense. So Aristotle invoked the notion of catharsis as a way of trying to explain uh, the aesthetic experience and the transformative experience of wit witnessing tragedy, a, dra a tragic drama. Um, and so catharsis is properly understood as a way in which you are playing with identity um, in order to release ways in which you are hurting or in ways in which your development is being thwarted or ways in which um, you have been uh, wounded uh, and, and give you a way of, well, a, seri a, a serious play, uh, the pun intended there too, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a serious play uh, that would allow you uh, to start to break the grammar of how that has become immovable within you. It's, it's a way, I talk about overcoming existential inertia, the way in which these patterns get locked in and we can't, we've, they've so reciprocally narrowed us, and we talked about this last time, right, reciprocal narrowing, that we're sort of addicted to the identity we have and the, and the world we're in, and we, we don't, we, we want, I want to be over there, right, but we're, 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 we're locked in and there's a, a tremendous inertia that almost like a locomotion, you know, a locomotive that just can't get started because there's a, right, there's, right, there's all that inertia. And so, that, that notion of catharsis, I think, is something that needs to be brought into this discussion. And I think it needs to be integrated with the pursuit of self-transcendence, which is something that, uh, as you know, I've been emphasizing a lot, uh, and how that connects to what you just indicated, mattering, being connected to something that has a value beyond your individual egocentric perspective. Um, and so that, yeah, it's stasis. And, and then, of course, we've been talking throughout about communitas, all of this stuff about dialogos and dialectic is communitas. But I, I want to give uh, Jamie credit for, yeah, the, the catharsis element needs to be properly uh, brought in as well. Uh, the, the danger there uh, is, and this comes up specifically within specific practices like circling or like dialectic, it, the danger there is for these practices to degenerate into therapy, even group therapy, mm, mm -hmm. right? We're trying to steer between uh, theory and therapy in what we're doing here, uh, the sort of Scylla and Charybdis. Uh, uh, and so the really tricky thing is people, like, you know, when you're teaching people to, to meditate, the brain, know, the brain, the brain has two, two things. It's like, uh, you close your eyes. Oh, I know what we're doing. We're mind wandering. Yeah, yeah. You know, no, no, brain. That's not what I'm doing. Oh, I know what we're doing. We're falling asleep. No, no, brain. We're not doing that. And th these are the two big options. And you're trying to find that little, you know, the narrow path. And you're, you know, you're trying. What you're largely doing is trying to grow the width and the depth of that path, that path with practice, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing here. Like people, oh, I know what we're doing. We're theorizing. No, no, we're not. Oh, I know what we're doing. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. We're doing therapy. No, no, we're not. We're trying to find the space between those and then widen it and deepen it uh, through practice. And so, um, yeah, bringing in the catharsis uh, brings with it that risk. Um, and that's why it's very, that's why I'm doing a lot to try and situate this uh, within, within by Leah Sophia. It's, it's interesting because uh, Rand Lahav in his work on philosophical contemplative companionship uh, does the same thing. He says that this is, it's, it, it's in the family, by the way, the dialectic family. He says, this is a, a group practice you do that's trying to not be like philosophical counseling where you're doing, dealing with a person's individual sort of therapeutic uh, needs. And it's not like a phil uh, philosophy cafe where you just get together and talk about topics. You're trying to get the transformation from the therapy, but you're trying to get the education uh, uh, that you get from theory. And you're trying to yeah, like almost like, you know, stereoscopic vision. You're trying to look through both into something beyond both of them. Yeah, that was beautiful. 
I have this um I have this kind of clunky visual coming up. It's like a like a pyramid of of focus. So we have again at at this top this kind of reinvigorating religio in both individual collective. You know, we come down to the second tier, which is okay, well that is done through right relationship of self, other world, which we laid right. out. And it again, one of the reasons I love Jamie's work is because he he seems to always come from the bottom of the pyramid while everyone else is coming from the top. And so then we get this other layer of like, okay, well, to do that, you can tweak the dials of ecstasis, catharsis, communitas, right, mm-hmm. to, to trickle up to that. And he actually, this is all in, I just want to give him a shout out. Um, he did a talk called The Potential and Pitfalls of Transformational Culture. Mm-hmm. It's up on YouTube. If you want to see him riff on this stuff for an hour, please go check that out because it's amazing. And, you know, below those dials, the three dials he lays out, he actually has like a kind of five tools that you can use. Scripture, sacraments, ethics, metaphysics, and deities. And it's like, look, if you actually want a game plan to go build some of this yourself, you know, you have your aim, right? You have what you're working towards. You have the kind of knobs and the tools that you can use to do it. Get a group together, play around talk about it, put some practices out, and then you get this thing that when iterated over time becomes what we've been working towards. It's like this group of people tackling these problems and actually making some, hopefully, making some good headway on them. Yeah, I think that's well said. Again, I think we need to do that in some way differently than we have in the past because there's always been the bottom-up aspect. Yeah. Uh, and that's good, by the way, that there's always been, uh, like you're pointing to. Um, and I think we need as much cognitive science about that machinery as we can possibly yeah. uh, bring to bear. Um, it's so I, I'm really interested in both the uh, innovations happening within the cognitive sciences telling us about all of this bottom-up machinery and the top-down, but more of the bottom-up. And I'm also interested in like supplementing that with uh, participant observation and discussion of the bottom-up emergence of people uh, tweaking these things, uh, trying to figure out what, what will be the kinds of things that will not be idiosyncratic uh, to an individual or just to a particular group um, within a particular historical um, or physical environment. Um, you know, you know this is Paul van der Klee's issue, right? This, this has to be, uh, you know, scalable. It has, to be, it has to be something that can be shared across a lot of the things that normally divide us um, or else, as you've reminded us repeatedly, we're not going to have what we need in order to um, deal with what is facing us right now. And, you know, COVID, well, we talked about this last time, it just accelerates all the issues of the meaning crisis and it does that, and in conjunction with doing that, it's accelerating a lot of the way in which things are fracturing and fragmenting. Yeah. And I think people are starting to understand that. I think they're starting to understand it, unfortunately, in a kind of unhealthy way. When people are starting to talk about pandemic fatigue. Uh, people are starting to realize it's not going back to the way it was before. Right? That's right. And they've been sort of, a lot of people, I've got, I get the sense we're holding their breath. <gasps> Yeah. I'm waiting, right? Okay, now let's go back. Um, doesn't look like it. Doesn't look like that's that's the way to frame things right now. And so, what I'm saying is, we we need to again. I, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but we need to reach as deeply into the roots of our tradition to grow up into the uh, you know the novelty of the sunlight. Um, if we're gonna if we're gonna grow what we need here. Uh, we have to be doing both uh, if we're going if, if we're going to really create something uh, that has the structure, uh, the growing structure that we need uh, to address our issues. Yeah, beautifully said. And I also, I, I've certainly had this sense in myself, and I, I think I think it's shared shared by many. This sense of, oh yeah, but who am I to do anything about this? What can I actually do? What can I actually contribute? 
And again, I got to shout out Jamie on this. I love the little progression that he gave. He was like, what we're actually trying to do here is we're trying to take as many people from NPCs, like non-player characters, (laughs) actual players to like show up and play games. Maybe again, games that have been already established by people, totally cool. But once you're an experienced player, actually becoming an architect, like start building these things with people and and the uh, like architects of culture, like actually just show up start doing this you can fumble around in the dark a little bit again that's also why you know containers communities are super helpful so we're not fumbling as much as possible but it's like you can always do something with what you have with where you are and if you do feel the a the growing need individually or collectively you recognize it like let's go you know there's a seat at the table for you you're a human on earth there are enough seats for everyone but uh it'd be really wonderful if we all showed up shared our voice started playing started building very much i mean and and i want to emphasize that and uh, extrapolate a bit on it so when systems are very stable it's actually very hard for any individual part or component uh, of that system to make much of a difference because there's all these redundancies built in there's all these constraints um But when systems are very destabilized that they are now, you get what's called sensitive dependence on initial conditions. A very small difference by an individual component Mm -hmm. can, you know, butterfly effect out into the system in ways you can't um, anticipate. You know, for want of a nail, for want of a nail, the horse, right, was unshod. And because the horse was unshod, the message wasn't delivered. Because the message wasn't delivered, the battle was lost. And because the battle was lost, the kingdom fell, right? And so you, you don't, right? when we're, I get it, again, because we have, again, we've developed these worldviews and these models that, uh, you know, have unfolded across millennia, um, you know, how old is Christianity, right, and things like that, um, we, we, we get a sense, well, you know, I can't do much, and maybe that was true, uh, but I would argue that's not true now, you like you don't know and the way things just boom now and the way they, they just take off like you know i've been doing the uh the 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 weekly morning uh meditation contemplation you know and a sangha grew up i didn't make that happen by the way the yeah. sangha grew up and then people started forming relationships and then a discord server was created right and then the discord server the sangers like and, like and it just goes right don't try and move the world, I'm quoting Socrates here, move yourself. Mm. If everybody moves themselves, the world moves, right? And so, um, yeah, I think uh, there, I've been, I mean, I'm I'm also influenced by stoicism. You shouldn't inflate how much you can change things. You've gotta be always rational about it because you can get uh, very inflated. Um, But I have been, Again, let me try and do this very carefully. Mm -hmm. Thread the needle here. I've been impressed by how my actions interpenetrated in connection with the actions of others, and then how that created things so rapidly and so powerfully beyond what I foresaw happening. Yeah. 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 That's worth that's worth underscoring. Uh, Some of the team and I over over on these parts have a have a word that we love it's called indicated and the way i would describe it to people is like if you're standing on a road and it's a black street and you don't know where to go you don't know what to do you don't know what the next step forward is if you earnestly search for it both just with what you can think yourself through and actually feel is appropriate eventually something comes up that's like one of the street lights turning on yeah. and boom it's like oh okay i need to move in that direction a really silly example but can be useful is like if you're thinking of you want to take a trip somewhere and the next week later your friend comes up telling you a story about costa rica and then you see on facebook this this other story about costa rica you're like there are a lot of countries in the world and only one has come up multiple times like there's this there's this flashing alarm this this signal to you and if you can just take like the next indicated step over and over and over again, again, you get these massive snowballs where it's like, look, you know, there's a pandemic, you know, people are kind of freaking out. Can I help them meditate? Sure. So small, so simple, so basic. And yet, 
you know, a couple months down the road, we're now here with this organic evolving community yeah. doing beautiful work together. And it's like, well, if I tried to do that at the beginning, maybe I couldn't have hold it like held that weight. Yeah. Maybe I just wouldn't have done it because it would have seemed too big, but you know, I'm just going on YouTube doing meditations for people. I can do that. And again, you know, we are such a large body of people, right? You can't underestimate the power of everyone actually doing that over and over and over again. And if the steps are small enough, you can do daily, you go far. And this is again, why we've got to give up again, not again, not individual moral responsibility, but we have to give up individualism uh, because I mean, uh, this is where Jordan Hall, I think, is bang on with his slogan. The next Buddha is the Sangha. Uh, the next Buddha is the Sangha. Uh, the only thing that we're capable of that will have the cognitive computational power for solving the complex issues and at the rate at which those issues are evolving and changing is our very wisest, most comprehensive forms of distributed cognition. You always stand on the shoulders of humanity, you know, regardless of where you are. And I think for a lot of us, this is actually where, again, religion is something very useful. Those with religion seem to absorb that very nicely. Like, yes, of course, yeah. I'm part of this beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah. And those of us who are maybe a little more Western scientific, it's like, well, no, I'm, I'm a self-made man. I've done this all myself. And it's like, you use English that you didn't create. <laughs> yeah. You use farming techniques that you never made. Like, almost, <laughs> there's very little about you that's self-made. You didn't even make your body. Like, your parents yeah, yeah. did that. Like, there's very little of you that's self-made. And yes, I yeah, agree. It's, it's actually a perspective, right? That can, that can be empowering or... I guess an obstacle for some, but it definitely doesn't have to be. Well, I mean, again, uh, you have to look at these things historically. I mean, individualism as a, a, an ideology arose to try to counterbalance um, the way in which collectives uh, can become totalitarian. Um, and again, uh, but it, it's, it's a kind of overcompensation. It's a compensation that has worked by denying um, uh, a, a the, the, the overwhelming reality uh, of distributed cognition. So the solution is to acknowledge the critiques that motivated individualism, but propose ways of keeping distributed cognition wise, meaning dynamically self-correcting so that we avoid um, some of the perils that individualism rose in response to. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. So I, I've, two kind of last things I want to bring up. One we've Please. touched a little bit on. One is a little bit, uh, I guess you could say selfish, but I think it's, I think it'll end up being super useful. So actually, again, inspired by a lot of your original series, you know, I was, I was off looking, I was off looking for an answer of like, what does this thing look like? Can I find an example of this? Cause I'm down to like be a player. I'm down to participate in it and see, see if I can, you know, bring something to the table there as well. One of the few things that kept coming up for me over and over again was yoga. Mm -hmm. Yoga as a philosophy and as a way of being, particularly the way of being thing, because I think like many things that we've kind of poured it over, it's been a little distorted with the classic yeah. you know, Monday yeah. morning Lululemon yeah. yoga mat, but that's not exactly what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the much more robust philosophy that's endured for, again, generations and generations. And there were a few things in there that appealed to me really deeply about this that I'd love to just kind of get your sense on what you think of. So again, we talked about self other world. We talked about ecstasis, catharsis, communitas, scripture, sacraments, ethics, metaphysics, deities, all of these things. And actually for all the kind of check boxes that I was looking for, again, yoga seemed to be one of the few things that actually checked off something near a majority of them. It has a very clear overarching goal which is basically recognizing yourself as the awareness that all things show up from and recognizing that as you know basically all that is cool the thing i found extremely interesting was that it actually doesn't force you into a path to that realization there are actually kind of four larger branches there's yep. an yep. academic intellectual one where you can come to that realization through study of scripture cool there's one of kind of devotional ritual where you do prayer, chanting, dance, come to the same realization, totally different path. There's, there is the very classic kind of self-mastery, 
awkward poses, meditation one where you come to the same realization. And then there's a selfless service like, you know, you know, uh, showing up for others and in that way coming to the same realization. And that felt like almost something I'd never seen before. Because at least in my conception, you know, a lot of the other practices, a lot of the other religions was like, yo, get on this car, take this path, it'll take you here. But of course, different people have different dispositions. Some are way more intellectual, some are way more in the heart. And to have something that met you where you were at, but took you to the same place, that felt absolutely incredible. And then of course, you know, it actually increases in levels as you go up. You know, you can, the, the classic asana posture practice is probably the greatest example where it's like, if you're a beginner, it can meet you there. And after you've been studying it for three decades and are much more, have much more mastery over it, you still have in the same vehicle, a set of, of practices, a way to live your life, uh, a daily routine that is still just, just as useful for you. And that whole flow from like the way I spend my Tuesdays grows with me and leads me to the same thing and I can do it in a community. I don't know. Something about that just feels like resoundingly hopeful or like, wow, this could actually have some serious potential. So, I mean, I think it's what you said is well said, uh, especially how you prefaced it. I I want to return to the caveat uh, because yoga, Tai Chi Chuan, mindfulness practices have all been, uh, reduced and commodified. Um, yeah. And if, I mean, yoga originally means yoking. It's the same, it, it's, it's got the same uh, Indo-European, uh, Indo-European, Indo-European root as conjugal, like when people are having sex, mm-hmm. right? It's about, it's about da'ath. It's about that kind of falling in love with that which transcends you. Uh, so, right, um, you are drawn into uh, self-transcendence. Um, so uh, I think all of that is exactly right. Um, and I do think that what you're pointing out is if we ignore the Western reduction, there's an ecology of practices. Because even if you're in, in, in any one of these paths, you're not just doing the postures. There's a, yeah. a whole. So before my manures got bad, uh, I was for uh, I had taken up with my partner. Uh, she and I were doing yoga regularly, and it was very much a spiritual practice um, and being taught more in that way. Of course, that varies with the instructors. There were some instructors. There, we have a joke in martial arts of punch and kick studios, dojos, right? Where all you, you just go there, you learn how to punch and kick. And it's like, oh, yeah, great. It, when, when you're 15, that's so cool. And when you're 33, that's so useless. Um, and so, uh, it, my, to my mind, there's some instructors that are more just punch and kick yoga, right? They're just, oh, yeah. do this and huh, bend that. And oh, right. So, but there's people that come in, like what I was taught with Tai Chi, and like there's a whole ecology of practices uh, going around it. And then, and then what you just pointed out to the pluralism, right? That different people are going to need because of their own idiosyncratic timing and placing in you know, how they are going through their lives and the relationships they've formed and the histories they've had and the woundings they've suffered um, and, and the socioeconomic and political structures that they've, uh, you know, in, internalized and endured, right? All of those things, you know, as well as, as you said, you know, personality variables, et cetera, all of those things, we, we just can't ignore them. Yeah. But of course, other traditions have this too. Um, they're harder to see. But if you take a look, for example, within Christianity, you don't have a single monastic tradition. You have, uh, you know, Augustinian, Jesuit, Dominican, right? You, again, right? And you have, and there's different mystical traditions, even within those different monastic traditions, right? Um, And so we, even something that looked like it was, you know, monolithic, you know, hence the name, the Catholic Church, Right, the universal one church, it, it was very much in practice uh, a, a very pluralistic uh, model. And, and notice again, you had priests and you had monks. They, they were even different uh, individuals. Uh, so I think if you look carefully, this is not to take anything away from yoga, um, 
But I think if you look carefully, many of these traditions have understood, at least in orthopraxis, if not in orthodoxy, right? They have understood pluralism, not relativism, but pluralism. And so the degree to which I think you saw yoga as giving you an ecology of practices and really exemplifying pluralism and having a pedagogical program, a philia Sophia. Yeah, of course, that's what, that's, that, sorry, I don't mean to trivialize, but my excitement is, yeah. yes, that has to be, I would argue, the way it has to be. What I would say, and what I'm trying to say is, I do think the other traditions have that, but, well, for reasons we talked about like last time, the West's connection to its own wisdom, tradition, and heritage is seriously severed and fragmented and malformed. Um, and so, and it's interesting because we finished, um, we're no longer doing, as of, was it last Friday or the Friday before? We, I can no longer, because of my schedule, uh, do the weekly morning classes. I'm back at university. My son's back at uh, university. Uh, uh, my, my tech advisor, he's, he's getting a new job. It's like, great. Uh, so we're now, we're now, we, we're now no, no longer doing them. We did 111. How auspicious is that, eh? One, one, one. Uh, but <laughs> so uh, uh, we, we finished the, the, the weekly morning classes. Uh, sorry, the, the, the daily morning classes. We now go to a week. We're now doing a weekly Saturday Sangha from 10 to 11. But the point I was trying to make is, so we went through the Eastern traditions. We went through, uh, you know, what we, uh, Buddhism and the Taoist traditions and what we can draw from that. But now we're turning to the Western wisdom tradition. We're going through McLennan's book, The Wisdom of Hypatia, and we've learned Epicureanism, and now we're doing Stoicism. Epicureanism is like sort of primary school skepticism, not skepticism. Uh, Stoicism is high school, and then we, we and then you go into Neoplatonism, which is like university. And it's amazing how people are resonating as profoundly as they did when they encountered these practices from the Eastern traditions, how much they're resonating with this, which is actually in the roots of their own tradition. It's really, really an, uh, an interesting thing to witness. So along, again, there's a pluralism. The ancient world recognized it. Uh, the Marcus Aurelius endowed four chairs, right? Uh, a chair in Aristotelian philosophy, Stoic philosophy, Epicurean, and Platonic. He's a Stoic, but he recognized the need for pluralism, right? Mm -hmm. Again, not relativism, pluralism. These all talk to each other. They mutually inform, constrain, they share principles, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, yeah, I think, I think the fact that that so plugged into you is evidence for how important ecologies of practices, pedagogical programs, pluralism, how important it is just how important it is yeah there we go again this is this is really what i was hoping to to kind of explore with this of like these are the knobs these are the dials that you can tweak yeah. yourself that you can look for in the world that if you feel called you could damn well very well build with other people right you could yeah. build with a community yeah. um, because it does you know that feels like the next step so I actually agree. you know i really just have kind of one thing i want to queue up for you which is just any other, just any other thoughts, you know? So we started the first conversation with making the case, right? Building the foundation. What is going on here? Why should you give a damn? You know, we've walked through a fair bit today of, okay, if you actually want to answer the call, if you actually want to show up and move either into being a player of this game or an architect of the whole game itself, you know, here's some things you can consider. Here's some dials you can tweak. Yeah. Um, where do you want to leave people with? Like, where should someone, if they listen to both of these and they're like, hell yeah, like I'm in, I'm going to go build something amazing. I'm going to build something super cool with super cool people. Where to next? Well, I mean, that's a difficult question to answer <laughs> because of the very thing we talked about, pedagogical programs and pluralism. Yeah. I mean, you need to know where people are at. I think people need to cultivate a lot of skills, both individually and collectively, uh, you know, skills of mindfulness, uh, skills of rational reflection, uh, training of the imagination, uh, psychosomatic, meaning body-mind, right? Uh, like yoga, uh, uh, skills, uh, movement practices, 
uh, like that Rafe talks a lot about. I, I, I agree. I think those are central to transformation because of the way cognition is so embodied and enacted. Uh, they, so there's a lot of, uh, you need to individually and collectively, collectively and individually, interpenetrating individually and collectively, you need to cultivate skills and virtues. Uh, uh, that, and so there's lots of places to go. I mean, that's why uh, I'm not just doing these dialogues. Like I said, I offered the, 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 the daily morning classes and now at least the weekly morning classes and I'm putting up courses and, the, and you've got people like Rafe Kelly who, you know, who are organizing or uh, Chris and I are putting together the anthology, which will introduce you to people who are literally creating ecologies of practices and communities that you can get involved with. So there's a lot there, but I mean, in, in Neoplatonism, there's this wonderful idea that you, you can receive things according to uh, your degree of receptivity. And uh, Jung said something similar. Uh, don't, don't try and take on a wisdom that you haven't earned, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, 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 and so start where you're at and ask yourself, really, you know, what, is, what ecologies of practices do I have? Not what do you believe. Don't tell me what you believe. I'm <laughs> sick and tired of that. Sorry, that's a little too rude. But like, don't, our culture is so drenched. This is what I believe. Who cares? Yeah. Who cares? Right? Sorry. You know what I care about? Tell me what you practice. Yeah. Tell me what you practice because practice is how you can be transformed and how you can help others transform and how together we can transform the world. Tell me what you practice and practice means what do you do that challenges you to change and development individually and collectively review your practices. Look at what's out there. Go to places where you can learn to start practicing, to acquire the skills and virtues that you need in order to move more and more towards being wiser. Wow. Wow, that was incredible. Yeah, you know what came up was just uh, show me where you spend your time, attention, and money, and I'll tell you yeah. what's important to you. Yeah, exactly. That exactly. is true. It's exactly. true for the reason. Exactly. Yeah, wow, that was, that was extremely beautiful. Honestly, I don't think I have much more than that. Uh, that feels... That feels absolutely. good to me, too. It feels like it, 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 it's at least got the closure of this particular dialogue. Yeah, for sure. Wow, that was incredible. Well, there you have it, folks. Round two with John Verveke. Building the religion. It's not a religion. That was really wonderful, John. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Eric. Uh, again, uh, this was wonderful. I'd be happy to come back again. I find uh, these discussions are... Well, they're true dialogos. We, I get to a place with you that I can't get to on my own. Um, and um, I, I know that um, the people that follow my work uh, found our last uh, conversation, last video, tremendously helpful. Um, and so thank you once again. Beautiful. Thank you.